Waking up in a hospital with no memory of how I got there was the beginning of my unraveling. Lydia, why? You were my life. And you stabbed me in the back. Discovering my wife's affair with my own brother Robert and my father also was a cruel twist in what I thought was a well-scripted life, the betrayal cutting deeper than the physical wounds I bore. This is my story. Enjoy watching it. He kept feeling the same thing over and over, a bright flash, then pain and dark. Sometimes he heard voices but couldn't tell who they were or what they said. He tried to speak, no luck, tried to move but couldn't. This time, though, the light was weird, like looking through mist. He couldn't see well or focus. Shapes moved in front of him and he tried to shout but couldn't. Sounds came to him but they were just noise. He tried moving but no luck. Tried to yell but only a weak noise came out, tired. He rested then the dark came back for a while. He didn't know how long it was before the light came again. He pushed himself to move and finally could, but it was so hard. Tried to yell but only a bad sound came out. Felt like something was stuck in his throat. A shape moved in front of him, stopped, then ran off, making a loud sound. This time, more shapes came and stood around him. He blinked, trying to see clearly. The shapes moved fast, doing stuff he didn't get. Then he heard someone talk. Mr. Smith, do you hear me? A man's voice. Who's Mr. Smith? He wondered. But he could hear the man and tried to nod. It was hard, but he did a small nod as things got clear. He saw he was in a hospital bed and people in doctor clothes were working to help him wake up. One who looked like a doctor said something about checking if he could breathe by himself. Then he felt tape come off his face and something pulled from his throat. Breathing felt great after that. Okay, good, the man said as he looked around. He saw wires on his body, a thing to check his blood on his arm and a needle in his other arm. He felt a tube in his private part. Looking at the wall, he saw a very small TV and a chair. There was something about President Trump. Trump? He wondered how long he'd been here. Barack Obama was president when he last remembered. How long? He asked softly. Before talking, the doctor looked at a big chart. It's been about ten years, Mr. Smith, he said. Ten years? What happened? And who is this Smith guy everyone keeps talking about? He wondered. Simply relax, Mr. Smith. We'll check you out and get you into rehab. As he watched, the nurses removed his arms and legs from the restraints and held him on the bed while the doctor adjusted his notes. He turned to another nurse before speaking. Do we have Mr. Smith's contact information? He asked. A young nurse checked her computer and replied in the positive. Very good. Let them know. The nurse started making a call, and the man wondered who would come to see him. His recollection was still somewhat hazy, but he remembered being married with an eight-year-old daughter. My God, he believed my daughter Jenny would be 18 and definitely ready for college. He thought about his wife, Lydia, but didn't appear very eager in seeing her. Something about seeing his wife. He wasn't sure what made him repelled and angry. Well, Mr. Smith, the doctor explained, your vital signs appear okay, but we'll do some tests anyhow. Once we get those back, we'll remove your feeding tube and take you to your room. You'll be our guest for a little period, but we'll get you into a recovery center and back on your feet, okay? The man nodded. Doctor, he said. Who is Smith? Before returning his gaze to the patient, the doctor looked down at his notes. Why? Are you? He said. It appears that you may be experiencing forgetfulness. I am not surprised. Really. You have been through a lot. That is okay. We will assign someone to deal with you right away. You simply relax, and we will get you set up with that. On his way out, the doctor left instructions for a couple of nurses. He knew who he was, and it was not the Smith character. His name was Avery Wilson. He was born in 1972 to Dan and Barbara Wilson. He had a brother named Robert, who was a year older. He entered the army at 18, straight out of high school, and was trained as a sharpshooter. He spent the next four years in various conflict zones across the world, including Kuwait. He survived Desert Storm and returned to Southern California in 1994, where he earned an associate degree in criminal justice in 1996. He'd always wanted to be a cop, so he joined the LAPD and put his military expertise to use. In 1997, after graduating from the police academy, he was promoted to sharpshooter. He met Lydia Jackson and married her in 1999, after dating her for two years. 
he felt everything were fine. In October 2000, they had their daughter, Jennifer. He remained in the force while his wife worked as an attorney at the same firm where his brother was a partner. He won a substantial lottery prize in late 2008, and everything went wrong after that. When he won the jackpot, he discovered by chance that his wife had been having an affair with his brother for quite some time. Fortunately, his good friend and confidant Ben Jacobs had convinced him to open an overseas account under a new name, preventing Lydia from accessing the majority of his lottery winnings. Ben, as a financial expert, managed the account for him. He also placed him in touch with a true shark of an attorney who despised cheating wives and despised Robert even more. He also set up surveillance on Lydia and Robert and was able to obtain photos and video of their trysts. He had intended to confront his wife about her affair, but something happened. He couldn't recall the events of that night, but he was confident that everything would come back to him shortly. The next thing he remembered was waking up in this hospital room a decade later, weary. He lay back down and watched the nurses perform their duties on television. But who was the Smith character? What was that about? He reflected on his life as he watched the local news. According to the report, Robert Wilson has declared himself a candidate for public office. He pondered if Robert Wilson may be his brother. As he watched, a well-dressed man with some gray around his temples addressed a crowd outside a skyscraper in downtown Los Angeles. Lydia and a teenage girl who resembled an adult version of him stood next to him. Jenny. And I told the people of this magnificent state that I would restore ethics and accountability to our state government, Robert remarked to some applause. Sacramento is out of control, and we need to get back to basics. Following this, Robert turned to kiss Lydia on the cheek. She was two years younger than Avery, and he believed she had the best looks money could buy. Wilson, who was accompanied by his wife and kid, made his declaration this afternoon and is already leading in the polls following the horrific shooting murder of his brother Avery in 2009. Wilson has dealt with families of deceased police officers. The news announcer said this while showing a photo of him in his police gear. What the hell? The man pondered as he viewed the report. Death. I'm not dead, you a-hole, he told himself. And what's with Jenny being Robert's daughter? He lowered his head and attempted to recall the events of the previous few days that had led him to the hospital. But his mind kept going blank. His thoughts turned back to the major events in his life, attempting to discover an answer. He had thought about his older brother, Robert, for as long as he could remember. Robert was the bane of his life. He was not only a bully, but he also enjoyed taking advantage of his younger brother. Money. Credit for everything he did. His goods, including his girlfriends. Robert seemed to want whatever he had, regardless of whether he needed it. Worse, his parents agreed with whatever Robert said or did. And whenever Robert did something wrong, he always flipped it around so that his parents would punish his younger sibling. He grew up loathing his older brother, and the abuse he endured from his parents didn't help. Robert was the nice son who would achieve something of himself, leaving Avery as the black sheep. It was so severe that he never informed his family that he had enlisted. He had recently graduated from high school and was heading to boot camp the next day. He had signed the enlistment paperwork one day after school, completed all of the physicals, and was ready to leave. Nobody knew where he was until he was obliged to contact home. You did what? When his father called, he roared. You get your mother back home right now, young man, Avery advised. I'm over 18. I'm already in boot camp, and there's nothing you can do about it. Do not expect to hear from me again. And with that, he slammed the phone down, thereby ending the call. He fulfilled his pledge and did not communicate with any of them until he graduated from the police school in 1997. That was not his decision, by the way. They discovered from the LAPD that he was graduating and came to visit him. He never forgot that day. He saw them while standing in formation following the talks. They stood to get their diplomas, and he noticed that they, including Robert, were watching him as he became the force's newest officer. After the ceremony, he tried to flee as swiftly as possible, but was stopped when they blocked his path, and they did not look pleased. You are not going to run away from us again, Avery, his father spoke. I knew you would eventually make something of yourself. I had thought you would have gone to college to become a lawyer like your brother and myself. Robert smirked briefly, but it swiftly faded. 
Yes, this is my option, and it is something that this shithead cannot take away from me, Avery said, looking at Robert. And just so you know, I made a name for myself in the army. Avery, please. His mother Barbara stated, We haven't seen or heard from you in seven years. Could you please be courteous with us just once? Maybe, just once. You and Dad had given me the benefit of the doubt. Things may have been different, but no, you always listened to him. He always took his side in everything and never gave me a chance, he stated. This is my day, and I'm not going to let you muck it up for me. Avery, Robert stated. I don't understand it. Why do you hate me so much? Are you kidding me? You were a bully. You took all I ever owned. Even my girlfriends, he explained. You blamed me for every bad thing you did. And you persuaded them to believe all of your falsehoods, he said, gesturing to his parents. His parents were surprised to hear him speak in this manner. He was usually very quiet and courteous. Who was the man before them, they wondered. So guess what? A hole. I'm done with you. I've paid my dues and am creating my own life. So keep out of it, he told Robert, his eyes filled with rage. Avery, son, what happened to you? His mother inquired, appalled by her son's language. This wasn't the same peaceful man who accepted everything they served him. He stared at his mother. I've grown up. He said, Mother, I became a soldier, and you know what? I have even killed men. She backed up little after hearing that. He proceeded. Do not worry, mother. All of them were nasty guys who deserved what they got. I am not the same person who grew up in your house, and I don't take bullshit from anyone. He stared at Robert before proceeding. He turned and walked away, leaving them open-mouthed. He hadn't seen them again until the day he married Lydia. He met her at a police event shortly after becoming an officer. She was working in the public defender's office at the time, but she wanted to work for a large business. He proposed one year to the day they met, and she accepted. They decided to have a long engagement to ensure everything worked out, and they married a year later. Divorce was rather prevalent among police personnel. He never invited his family to the wedding, but they came anyhow. He noticed them at the reception when Lydia pointed them out. Isn't this your family? She questioned, pointing at his parents and Robert. Yeah, he said. I'm not sure why they're here. You need to introduce me, please, she implored. Avery relented and walked his bride over to them. They grinned when Avery introduced his wife. Well, it's great to finally meet you, Avery's father said. I do not comprehend. Avery, why didn't we receive an invitation to your wedding? His mother inquired. It must have been an oversight or something, Avery stated. The truth was that he never invited them. I hear you'll be joining our firm soon, Dan said. Lydia stared at Avery, who appeared astonished. I apologize, Avery. Didn't you know the board just approved her today? No, I didn't know, Avery replied as Robert smirked. I apologize, Avery, Lydia said. I didn't know I had been accepted until just now. Avery nodded his head. That's fine, dear, he said. We will talk about it later. Mind if I dance with my new sister-in-law? Robert asked with a shit-eating smile. Avery brought him to the side and spoke to him quietly so no one else could hear. Listen up. A hole, he told his older brother. This is not high school. She's my wife, not a schoolgirl. I understand, Robert replied condescendingly. Avery gripped his shoulder. No, you do not. Do you know what I did for the army? Robert shakes his head. No. I guess you were a clerk or something, Robert stated. No, I was a sniper. I made a living by killing scum suckers like you, and I can blow your balls off from 1,000 yards away, understand? Robert's smirk vanished, and he gazed at his younger brother in shock. Is this a threat, Avery? He asked. Avery shakes his head. No a-holes. It's a goddamn promise, he said. Okay, Avery, I received it, Robert stated. Hands off, message was received. They walked back to Lydia and his parents. Can I have a dance, please? Robert asked in a respectful tone of voice. Lydia stared to Avery, who nodded in approval. What have you told him? His father inquired after they left. I gave him some wise, brotherly advice while watching his wife and brother dance. He was relieved to see them maintain a respectable distance from one another. He turned back to his father. You know, Robert always managed to take my girlfriends when we were at school. I know, Avery, his father replied. Believe me when I say I did not approve of it. Yeah, you did nothing to stop it either, even when he rubbed it into my face in front of you. 
Avery informed him that this is different. She's my wife, and I fully expect you to police your firm's morals policy. I understand, Avery. His father spoke. Look, I apologize for all that has happened, but it is all in the past. Can't we simply put this behind us and move on? Please, Avery, his mother said. Could you kindly put your animosity for us aside so that we can become a family again? We'll see, mother, Avery stated. Barbara smiled. That is all I ask. I know you don't believe me, but we genuinely adore you. And we are very pleased of what you've accomplished, she continued. Avery nodded and accepted his mother's hug. Thank you. You're correct. I do not believe you. But deep inside, I adore you, too. There is a great deal of hurt that needs to be healed. And you may start by making sure he doesn't get his hooks into my wife, he said, glancing at his father. I understand, son. I will take care of it personally. I see that you do. As his wife and brother returned, leaving the reception for their honeymoon in Las Vegas, Avery turned to see Robert and his father, who were quietly discussing something while glancing at them. He hoped for the best, but experience had taught him to prepare for the worse. Lydia asked him about his relationship with his family while on the trip to Vegas. You know, your brother is a very charming man, she said. Bobby stated, he even asked me to call him. That's what all of his pals call him, but you don't, and he is your brother. Why? Avery told her about his childhood and how his brother had taken all he had, including his girlfriends. He informed her about the spankings and groundings he received as a result of his brother's actions, as well as how his parents always sided with Robert. So when it came time to depart, I did, he explained. I put everything behind me and created my own life. My God, I never knew. They never mentioned you at all. Honestly, if I had known any of this, I would never have applied to their firm. It's okay, Avery assured her. However, forewarned is forearmed. Look out for Robert. He is trouble. And yeah, his charm is all a ploy to get his way. Trust me, I've seen it too many times. You can trust me, sweetie, she said. I will never do anything to hurt you, ever. He believed her, yet he lived according to the phrase, trust, but verify. He maintained his eye on her, what she wore to work, and when she had to work late, her general demeanor and how she smelled when she arrived home. Jenny was born two years after her parents' marriage. She was his little child and could always make him happy. Lydia proved to be an excellent mother as well. For the first few years, his wife made no hint that anything was amiss, not even during the firm's various parties and events. He even began to open up to his parents and allowed them to spend time with their granddaughter. But he continued to keep an eye on things. If there was something going on, they were quite excellent at hiding it. He met Ben Jacobs, a multi-talented professional who dabbled in everything from financial advice to private investigations. The two got along well at a police conference in San Diego in November 2008, especially since Ben was also an Army veteran. They quickly became friends, and Avery felt comfortable in trusting the man with his life. That's when he first learnt of Lydia's infidelity. The previous Christmas, he had purchased two new Apple iPhones with a virtual keyboard and the ability to send text messages. He kept one for himself and gave her the other. He reasoned that they would help the two stay in touch no matter where they were. He was on his way back to their house in Los Angeles County when his phone rang, letting him know he received a message. He looked at the television and was horrified by what he saw. I had a terrific time tonight, love. See you tomorrow, it said. He verified the text which came from Lydia's phone and then put the phone away. He wasn't sure who the lover was. He suspected it was Robert. He wasn't sure who she may see the next day. And because they frequently collaborated on numerous projects and situations, he needed to devise a strategy before returning home. So he exited the interstate in Orange County and contacted Ben. Hey, Avery. What's up? Ben asked Avery. I received an odd message on my phone and need assistance. I think you could act as my personal investigator. For a short while? He asked. Yes, but it will cost you, Ben said. Yeah. Okay. He recounted what had happened, and Ben said he'd look into it. In the meanwhile, don't do something stupid, Ben said. Don't start blowing your brother's balls off. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Give me some time. It may take some time for me to gather evidence to use against them, especially given how cautious they have been up to this point. Ben informed him. Okay, stay in contact, Avery responded. Will do. Ben ended the call. How could she? Avery questioned himself. 
He fought back tears, yet he still lost. He was moved to tears as he recalled that day. The nurse's words returned him to the present day. Are you okay, Mr. Smith? The nurse asked. He realized he was crying and wiped his eyes. Yeah, he croaked with parched lips. Can I get something to drink? Sure, Mr. Smith. I will be right back. She remarked this while headed to the nurse's station. She returned a little later with a cup of ice water. As he gulped his water, the doctor entered the room. Good news, mister. Smith, he said. All of your tests came back. Good. So we'll remove your feeding tube and get you to your room. A couple of nurses entered the room and started working on him. He was soon relocated to a private room where he was able to consume genuine food for the first time in a decade. He watched the news while eating, and after he was finished, he heard a tap on the door. Come in, he replied, his voice still shaky. Johnny boy. How are you doing? The man stated as he entered. Avery stared at him and didn't immediately identify him. It's me, Ben. Remember? Yeah, I was just thinking of you, he said. Ben sat down next to Avery's bed and opened a briefcase after closing the door. How do you feel? He asked as he opened the case. Avery nodded his head, weak but becoming stronger. Ben, what the hell happened? Why do they keep calling me Mr. Smith? Why did you call me Johnny? That's because Avery Wilson died a decade ago. Ben stated that Avery or John glanced at him with disbelief. What? How? He asked. But I am still alive. Ben shakes his head. No, Avery has died. Your name is John Smith. According to the official records, Avery was slain during a home invasion when he returned to retrieve some belongings from his home. How much do you remember? The man shook his head before pulling out a laptop and setting it up in front of him. Watch this, he said, displaying a video. The video captured his wife, Robert, and Dean in a hotel room. Lydia was having sex with Dan and Robert following the climax. They sat on the bed, sipping their drinks. Avery will come over tomorrow to retrieve the rest of his belongings. Good, Dan stated. We can take care of him then. He stared at Robert. Do you think you've got what it takes to blast your own brother away? Robert laughed. Seriously? He asked. Hell, sure. I've been wanting to take that scum sucker out for a long time. Dan and Lydia both grinned. Do you see that? Dan stated. Make it appear like a home invasion. And for crying out loud, clean yourself up thoroughly and leave nothing left. I got it under control, Robert continued, as John sat stunned to hear his family plot to murder him. Ben brought up another video. This video shows Avery chained to a chair as Robert and Lydia were naked on the bed having sex. After they had finished, they sat on the bed and looked at Avery, who was shaking his head. He tried to cry out but was gagged and unable to speak. Lydia giggled as Robert pulled out a shotgun and pointed it at Avery. In the video, he says, Look here, the foolish cook is waking up. Finally, weaky watchy. As Avery focused on the scene before him, he began to struggle. Do not squander your time, little brother. What are your thoughts? I've taken your wife into your bed right in front of you. Your daughter is actually mine, and now I'm going to take your life, he continued. Lydia laughed. He pointed the shotgun and fired once, knocking Avery out of his chair. Is he dead? Lydia asked. Please tell me that you killed him. Robert approached Avery and prodded the body with the shotgun, but received no response. He put down the shotgun. Help me get him out of this chair, he told Lydia. It appears he was shot by a burglar. Lydia got out of bed and joined Robert, and the two of them moved Avery out of the chair and arranged his body so it appeared that he had been surprised and shot by an intruder. They showered, changed their clothing, and left. The video ended, but resumed later when paramedics placed Avery's body on a gurney while they watched. Lydia and Robert could be heard crying in the background. So you have film of Robert shooting me and did nothing with it? John asked. I had no choice, Ben explained. The feds instructed me to bury it. It appears that your father and brother were under investigation for employment. They've been dealing with some unscrupulous guys. Organized crime? John asked. Ben nodded his head. Among other things, he added, Hell, who do you think is funding your brother's run for state senate? So how did I survive? John asked. Someone up there seems to really like you, Ben said. There was extensive destruction. Fortunately, Robert is a far better lawyer than a shot. It was a medical marvel that you survived. If you hadn't fallen into a coma, the government would have already placed you under witness protection. They were able to make it appear as if you died. 
They even found a body that resembled you for the funeral. Was Lydia there? John asked. Ben laughed and nodded his head. Yeah, she fully embodied the part of the bereaved widow, Ben said. John laughed. What about Jen? John asked. She will be attending college soon. She has missed you a lot and hates her mother for what occurred. She's quite resourceful. You'd be really proud of her. So who has been paying for this? John asked. You remember the lottery ticket you won? He asked. John nodded his head. If you recall, you trusted me with it. So I made some investments and kept them all in an offshore account. It has expanded significantly, and this is what has been paying for your hospital stay. If you're careful, you'll have enough money in that account to last the rest of your life. Thank you for that, John stated. My pleasure. So what do you see occurring from now on? I would like to see my daughter, John stated, and I need to exact revenge on the a-holes that done this to me. All of them. Ben nodded his head. I understand, he replied. I had a hunch you'd say that. They talked for a while more, discussing their future plans, including exacting revenge on Lydia, Robert, and Avery's parents. John pondered using his sniper skills against them, but Ben talked him out of it. Wouldn't you prefer to see them suffer for a bit first? I've been asked. A nasty smile spreads across his face. What do you have in mind? John asked. His mood improved significantly once he set out a prospective plan. By the time Ben left, John was in a good mood. He even accepted his new persona with venom. Yes, he thought to himself. They would all be held accountable for their actions against him. He spent the next three days in the hospital, becoming stronger with each passing day. His imagination replayed the events that led to his shooting. He reflected on the closing days of his prior existence. In December 2008, after receiving Lydia's SMS message, Avery authorized Ben to install concealed cameras and microphones in his home. Ben went all out, placing concealed mics in his wife's automobile. He had no idea where the gadgets were, which he figured was probably a good thing. Ben somehow managed to install concealed cameras in their offices. He didn't know how his pal achieved it and didn't ask. Two weeks after receiving the communication, his friend invited him to his workplace via email. Hello, Avery. Ben spoke as he stepped in and shook hands. Are you prepared for this? Avery shakes his head. I don't know, he replied. Ben nodded in understanding. It isn't pretty. He held out a large packet of images of Lydia and Robert in various compromising postures. From what he could determine, all of their encounters took place in a hotel room or their office. Lydia appeared in some of the images alongside Robert and his father, Dan. One photograph depicted his mother. Barbara was also involved. It took everything he had to avoid being sick. There is more, Ben stated, launching a video on his computer while Avery watched. Lydia was blowing his father's tool. He recognized his father's office. After they finished, Dan poured them a drink and they took their seats, still nude. We've been extremely cautious to keep all of this from Avery, but he'll figure it out soon, Lydia added. He may be a boy scout, but he is not foolish. Robert and his father laughed. Please. Robert replied condescendingly. We've been doing this for maybe five or six years. He has yet to figure it out. We could probably screw in front of him and he would have no idea what was going on. Maybe we should fill him in for Christmas, he suggested. How about this? This Christmas after dinner, we gave him a small gift and let him watch. We'll offer him a small reward. And if he doesn't go along with the strategy, we go back to plan B. What is plan B? Lydia asked. You mean let our friends from the East take him out? Something like that, Dan stated. Your husband isn't the only sharpshooter out there, you know, Lydia laughed. You think Barb will go along with that? Lydia asked. Who do you believe came up with the idea? Dan stated. Lydia lifted her glass. So, here's to Barb and Christmas dinner, she added, smiling. Two males joined her. Avery felt much worse once the video concluded. My God, he exclaimed. They are all in on it, even my mother Avery. Moving forward, you must use extreme caution, Ben said. There are additional videos in here, and they're all equally horrible. So far, as far as I can tell, they've been pretty careful. They'd only been getting together roughly once a week until the previous three months. Ben took out a business card. I've taken the liberty of connecting you with the meanest divorce lawyer in the neighborhood. I've already provided her the evidence I presented to you. He said to use my phone to schedule an appointment. She is eager to hear from you. 
Avery called to set up an appointment with the attorney for that afternoon. What about their plan to take me out? Avery asked. I gave that information to the FBI, Ben said. But I'm not persuaded anything will come of it. Right now it's just talk. There is no sign that anything has been arranged. Finally, Avery, you must exercise extreme caution. If at all possible, maintain your typical behavior. I know it's going to be difficult, but you must protect yourself. Anyway, remain in touch, and I'll let you know if I receive anything else. Avery thanked his pal and set out to meet his lawyer. He arrived to the office of his attorney, Sally McIntosh. After he introduced himself, the receptionist ushered him in. Good afternoon, Officer Wilson, Sally responded, shaking his hand. Please call me Avery. Miss McIntosh, he mentioned, only if you call me Sally. She reported that in response, she took out a large folder and began right to work. Avery was impressed. I've already spoken with Ben, who provided me with the proof he gathered. I must say that this is definitely the most messed up circumstance I've ever witnessed in my career. So, what do you anticipate out of this? I would seek custody of my kid if she is truly mine, and I do not want to provide her with any support. I'd also like to go after Robert and my parents, he stated. Sally nodded her head. Sally explained that California is a no-fault state when it comes to divorce. We can file under irreconcilable differences and utilize the evidence as a bargaining tool when dividing property. In terms of custody, I'm afraid you'll come out on the short end of the stick, as most judges here award custody to the mother. Given your wife's salary, you may be able to leave without having to provide her with financial support. We can make that argument and see how the judge responds. How about Robert and the rest of my family? He asked. Unfortunately, California law prohibits litigation, citing alienation of affection. We might be able to identify other grounds for a lawsuit, but I'm not sure what will happen. All right, Avery advised. Do what needs to be done. When would you prefer to have her served? Sally asked. Avery thought for a moment. He mentioned Christmas Day. At my parents' house? Sally laughed. You're cold-blooded, she said. Divorce around Christmas. I like it. Given what I've seen, I'll also include a protective order, keeping her and your family as far apart from you as possible. Thank you, Avery said. Avery, I sincerely apologize for all of this. You seem like a good man, Sally said, concluding the meeting. Avery drove home in a fog, absorbing what he had witnessed and heard. He never imagined that his entire family would conspire against him. Lydia sensed something was wrong and attempted to approach him. What's wrong, my dear? She asked. Avery shook his head in disbelief. I just have a lot on my mind, he explained. One of my pals discovered his wife is cheating on him. He's taking it pretty hard. I'm sorry to hear that, she replied. I would never do that to you. Yes, right. He had a thought. Do you know that? He gazed at her, then shook his head. I hope to God you never do. He spoke in a monotone. Lydia wasn't sure how to handle this. Does he actually know? She questioned herself. He remained in his study after she had left and examined the evidence Bean had given him. He shook his head, disbelieving. Are you heading to bed? Lydia asked. Avery shook his head and waved her away. I have a lot on my mind. You go up, he said. He ended up sleeping on the sofa in his study. Lydia awakened him the next morning. Why didn't you get to bed last night? She asked. I was looking forward to some love. He glanced at her with incredulity. I was just going through certain things, he explained. Well, we have our work Christmas party tonight, right? She asked. He nodded his head. I expect you at the office around 430 this afternoon, and I hope your mood improves before then. Yeah, yeah, he replied. She went down to kiss him, hitting his cheek as he turned his head. Love you, she said as she walked away. Yes, me too, he said half-heartedly. Does he know? She asked herself as she walked away. That afternoon, Avery attended his wife's Christmas celebration, which was regularly held at her office. Robert greeted him as he stepped in. So look who the cat hauled in. He said his speech was slurred due to alcohol. Avery declined the offer of a drink and took a bottle of water. What? Are you too good to join us for a drink now? Robert inquired. I'm still on duty, Avery explained, and I hope you don't plan to drive tonight. Is little brother going to arrest me? Robert slurred. Only if you violate the law, Avery stated. Lydia and his father approached him. Lydia attempted to kiss him, but he turned away. Avery is threatening to arrest me, said. Can you believe that shit? 
Dan gazed at him. I'd probably arrest you, too. Dan remarked, after all you've had to drink. He stretched out to shake Avery's hand. Good to see you, son. Come in and join the party. Avery kept his hand on his sidearm while following his father and wife. Lydia placed her arm over her husband's. Relax, she said. You appear to be awaiting someone to assault you. Avery gazed at his wife. Police officers in uniform are always targeted. Do you know that? He said. He observed his surroundings and the glances of pity he received. Lydia's co-workers shook his hand and expressed their gratitude for his service. But he noticed it in their eyes. They were all familiar with one another. After a time, he excused himself and entered the men's room. Robert was there, cleaning his hands. Avery noticed the huge, diamond-encrusted Rolex on his arm. Nice watch, Avery commented. Is this new? Robert pulled it off and gave it to Avery. Yes, he said. It was a gift. Avery examined it and flipped it over. Merry Christmas. The inscription read, With all our love, your two girls, Lydia and Jenny. Avery returned the watch, noting Robert's smile. Nice. Avery finished, cleaned his hands, and departed before Robert could respond. He caught up with Lydia and his father as they were speaking with someone. I have to go, he said. Something has come up and I need to handle it. Lydia turned to kiss him, but he walked away before she could say or do anything. He did not look back at that point. He didn't care. After his shift, he went to a bar and drank a couple of beers before returning home. Why did she do this? He questioned himself. Lydia was home by the time he arrived, and she was furious. Where were you? She asked. I ended my shift and went for a few beers, he explained. What do you care about anyway? I care, she said. You are my husband and I love you. How much did Robert's Rolex cost you? He asked. Lydia's eyes widened. Did you see that? She asked. Yes, I saw it. And I noticed what you had inscribed. You are two girls. Seriously? Is Jenny his daughter? Tell me. Wife, he said. He's her uncle and my brother-in-law. Said, that is all. Really? Avery asked. Please do not disrespect my intelligence. I noticed the stares everyone in your office gave me. I am not stupid. It's not as you think, she said. Yes, right. Sorry. I don't believe you, he replied. Look, you have been asking me what I want for Christmas. Right now, all I want is your signature. My signature? She asked. On what? On the divorce papers, he stated. Divorce? She asked. I do not want a divorce. I love you. You are my hubby. Sure you do, he replied. When you open your legs for another man, you are expressing just this. I know a lot more than you may realize, so do not lie to me. I only want to know two things. What? She questioned why and how long. Lydia's gaze dropped to the floor as he stated this. It's been going on since a few months after I started with the firm, she explained. You mean this has gone on for the majority of our marriage? He asked. She nodded her head. I apologize, she said. I did not intend to hurt you. It was just sex. And Robert said, you got off on it. Didn't you remember anything I said about Robert? Avery asked. Did I ever tell you that I adore being a cock? I apologize, she said. He was very smooth and pleasant. I did everything I could to prevent you from finding out. When did my father join in on the action? He asked. Lydia's eyes widened. How did you know? She asked. It does not matter how. How long have you been screwing my father? He asked. That began approximately a year ago, she explained. We were all quite cautious. We honestly did not intend to hurt you. Am I Jenny's father? He asked. Of course you are, she said. Please forgive me if I do not believe you, Avery replied. I'll get DNA tests to find out for sure. How dare you? She started before Avery exploded. No, bitch, he replied. How dare you? You know how much I despise that scum sucker, but you had to go screw him anyway. And what about my father? No, all of this is on you. And sure, I am filing for divorce. All these years, I've loved just you. I'm the one that cared for you when you were sick. And I took care of Jenny since you were too busy. You were my life, and you stabbed me in the back. Now leave me alone. I'll do my best not to ruin Jenny's getaway, but you and a fair partner better not mess with me. He collected a few items and settled inside his office. He avoided his wife as much as possible, saying nothing to her. He spent as much time as possible with his daughter, aware that he would soon become a part-time father. Ben contacted him later, informing him that he had some new video. You appear to have sparked a flurry of activity, 
Ben stated as Avery went into the office. Ben began the latest video as Avery sat down. The video came from his father's office. As usual, the three lovers were naked and engaged in their customary activities. He knows Lydia, remarked Robert and Dan, shrugging their shoulders. So what Robert stated doesn't change anything. He's filed for divorce, Lydia revealed. Have you been served yet? Dan asked. Lydia shakes her head. Not yet, but I believe it will happen soon, she stated. So I think we'll just have to educate your spouse and let him know the situation. He has two options, go along with it or get royally screwed, Dan stated. Just take care. Lydia spoke. Do not worry, he's simply a foolish cop. He cannot do anything to us. Avery sat quietly when the video concluded. Ben warned, be very careful. I've already forwarded this to Sally and spoken with your supervisor. He assures me that he will have patrols out keeping an eye on everything. Ben handed him the key to an apartment he had arranged for Avery to stay in for a bit. Avery thanked him before leaving on Christmas morning. Lydia asked if he was heading to his parents' place. Yes, I will be there, he said. She bent down to kiss him, but he waved her away. Save it for your lovers, he advised. Please don't screw up Christmas. She spoke as she walked out with Jenny. Do you mean you've already screwed it up? He asked. Get away of here. I'll come along. Soon later, he noticed Lydia leave. He put on his uniform and checked to make sure he had his body armor. He already had the majority of his clothes and personal belongings packed and in his car. He called the process server to confirm the time he would arrive at the Wilson residence and agreed to meet him there. Then he notified his shift supervisor to have a patrol car on standby. He planned his arrival carefully and met the process server a block away. The man got in his car and pulled up in front of the house. They stepped out, and Avery rang the doorbell. Avery's father answered the door, astonished to see his son and another man. What is the significance of this, Avery? he asked. You do not need to ring the bell. We've all been wondering when you'd get here. Please, Mr. Wilson, Avery remarked in his best cop voice, holding his sidearm. I'm here for formal business. Is Lydia Wilson here? Yes, she is. You are aware of this. Please come inside, Dan stated. Avery shakes his head. Not now, Mr. Wilson. Could Mrs. Wilson kindly come to the door? Avery stated. Dan shook his head and motioned for Lydia, who arrived with Jenny. The process server addressed her. Mrs. Lydia Wilson? He asked. She nodded as he checked her identification and handed her the package. You have been served. Lydia began to cry as she opened the envelope. You're serving me divorce papers on Christmas? She inquired, tears running down her cheeks. How could you? That's far better than what you and my prior family had planned for me. I believe Avery stated. Jenny began crying as she observed her mother and looked up to her father. He knelt down to hug his daughter. What's happening, Daddy? She asked. I'm sorry, baby, but your mother has decided not to love me anymore. He said this while hugging her as she cried. I will see you as soon as possible and will never forget how much I adore you. Okay. Jenny cried, went to her mother and kicked her in the shins. I absolutely despise you. She screamed as she rushed away. Dan forced his way through the howling. Lydia, how dare you come here and ruin our family Christmas? He said, Mr. Wilson, consider yourself fortunate that I will not arrest you or the rest of your family for conspiracy, Avery explained, handing him another envelope containing photos and video from their trysts at the Marriott. He took special care not to include anything that had been filmed in their offices. Barbara and Robert had arrived at the door. What's happening? Barbara asked. Avery just served. Lydia has divorce papers. Dan stated that he knows. Barbara stepped back. Her face turned white. Yes, and I know exactly what the four of you had planned for me. Avery stated. I recommend that you thoroughly review the protection order and obey it to the letter. I will not hesitate to arrest you if you violate it. Protective order. Robert exclaimed. Why should I kick your bomb right now? He added, reaching out to Avery and intercepting him as Avery prepared to draw his sidearm. Don't touch him, dumb Danielle. Robert jerked his hand back. Dan gazed at Avery. Okay, if you want to call yourself an a-hole, you had the opportunity to be a part of something amazing, but you blew it, he said. I believed I was a part of something amazing. Avery stated that he looked at Lydia. I'll phone you after the first and set up a time to retrieve the rest of my belongings. In the meanwhile, I recommend that you obey the instructions and keep away from me. Okay. Avery, 
she said. I apologize. Yes, Avery said. Goodbye. Merry Christmas. Avery walked to the apartment Bean had prepared for him and unloaded. Merry Christmas, indeed. He spent the remainder of the day drowning his emotions with a bottle of Jack Daniels. The following week, his father called him. I'd like to visit you at my office this afternoon. Dan placed an order. Avery laughed. People in hell want ice water, too. That's not going to happen. Have you forgotten the order of protection? If you want to meet, please contact my attorney and schedule a meeting at her office with her present. He disconnected the line before Dan could say anything else and contacted Sally. She wasn't delighted that he called during her Christmas break, but she listened to what Avery said and agreed to meet with Dan, Robert, and Lydia in her office. She also promised to contact Dan and set things up. That afternoon, the five of them gathered in a conference room at Sally's workplace. Couldn't we have waited till after the new year? Sally asked. No, it cannot, Dan stated. Are you Mrs. Wilson's attorney? Sally asked. Dan gazed at Robert. Robert Wilson and I am both her attorneys, he explained. I imagine you don't mind stuff like conflicts of interest, do you? Sally asked. Let's see what the state bar has to say about that. What's so crucial that you had to meet with my customer over the holiday? Dan removed a folder from his briefcase and placed it on the table. I want Avery to end this foolish divorce and sign this agreement, he stated. Sally read the paper inside and laughed. She handed the paper to Avery, who read it and couldn't believe what he saw. You honestly expect my client to give up his rights as a spouse and consent to let his wife have sex with you and his brother? Mr. Wilson, you are out of your mind, and rest assured, I will take this to the state bar. Now get out of my office before I throw you out, she said. I am going to ruin you, Dan informed Avery. When I finish with you, you'll wish you hadn't been born. You are aware that communicating a threat against a police officer is a criminal offense, Sally stated. Get out before I arrest you all. Dan, Lydia, and Robert departed the office all red-faced. Avery apologized and thanked Sally profusely. I can't wait to get that hole in front of a judge, she added as she secured her office. Avery maintained his word and called Lydia after the new year to set a time to pick up the rest of his belongings. She informed him there would be no one at the house, and he blindly believed her as soon as he entered. He felt a prick on his neck before everything turned black. He was still sleepy when he realized he was chained to a chair. He tried to move but couldn't, realizing that tape was covering his mouth. He struggled but was unable to extricate himself. Prior to seeing the blinding flash of light, he heard someone mention something about taking his own life. That was the last thing he recalls before waking up in the hospital. John's rehabilitation had gone better than anyone could have expected. Not only had he regained his memory, but his body had also healed wonderfully, and he felt as strong as he had ever been. He noted that the surgeons had performed reconstructive surgery on his face, presumably to address the scars from the shooting. It wasn't much, and it left some minor scars, but it was enough to make him appear very different from before. Ben had also given him special lenses designed to conceal the color of his eyes. According to Ben, his daughter would visit his gravesite at least once a week, generally on Tuesday mornings on her way to school. John wanted to see Jenny up close and personal, so they felt it would be best if he could mask his eye color when they ultimately met. They also agreed on a retribution strategy that would be implemented once he was discharged from rehab. Fortunately, today was the day Ben arrived to the treatment center as John was receiving his final instructions. He packed his bags and headed to his friend's car. On his way to the flat, Ben had prepared for him. They discussed their strategy and decided not to start until John had the opportunity to meet Jenny. Once reaching the complex, Ben assisted his friend in carrying his items upstairs. John gazed around the one-bedroom flat. He was impressed by the furniture. Ben had chosen for him and was particularly impressed by the very huge flat-screen television hung on the wall. After showing him around, Ben gave him the keys to the apartment. He received the keys to a fresh new SUV as well as new bank cards. During his rehabilitation, John reintroduced himself to cutting-edge technology and learned how to use a smartphone. And the latest Windows operating system, I was able to begin utilizing the new computer Ben had set up in the front room. After thanking his friend, John settled in for the remainder of the day. Later, he drove the SUV to get a feel for it. He knew he'd have to get acclimated to driving in Southern California again, which he didn't look forward to at all.
He stopped to a liquor store and purchased a bottle of Jack Daniels and a pack of cigarettes. He hadn't smoked since he joined the police force, but he had the old craving and decided that because he was already technically dead, it didn't matter. He returned home, relaxed for the day, and watched some TV, after unwinding with a glass of J.D. and cigarette. He retired to bed for the night. He awoke early the next day, showered and dressed, and set out for the cemetery, intending to there before Jenny. He found the tombstone marker and sat down to wait. He's nursing the cup of coffee he bought on the way. Soon, he saw her walking down the trail. He stood up after emptying his practically empty cup into the trash can. When he approached her next to the tomb, she appeared to be saying something. She gazed at him before speaking. Do you know my father? She asked. He nodded before speaking. Yes, I did. We were in the army together, John explained. He extended his hand. Smith. He said, John Smith. Jenny took his hand and examined him attentively. Jenny Wilson. Nice to meet you, Mr. Smith. John Smith, he smiled. Please call me John, he said. She smiled and returned her attention to the grave marker. He was a hero, you know, she said. I also served in the police force. As she talked, tears welled in her eyes. You truly miss your father, don't you? He asked. She nodded her head. I haven't seen him since I was eight years old, she explained. I miss him so terribly. I like to stop by early in the morning and say hello. My mother would murder me if she knew. Really? John asked. Yes, she said. She married my uncle after my father was dead. My father had just filed for divorce. He was killed soon after. Do you know how this happened? John asked. She said that a burglar shot him. I assume you don't believe that, John stated. She shakes her head. My father was the best cop there was. I don't think he was taken by surprise, she said. I can't prove otherwise. What do you think happened? John asked. I don't know, she said. I can't believe a burglar took him by surprise. John nodded his head. It happens, you know, he said. Yes, but not to my father. Jenny spoke. So have you determined what you want to accomplish with your life? John asked. I don't mind, John, she replied. I hope to attend UCLA this September. I want to become a lawyer, but not like my mother or uncle. I want to become a prosecutor. I want to put the bad guys away. I think I owe it to my father. Your dad would be really proud of you, John stated. Tears well up in his eyes. He so wanted to put his arms around this girl and tell her everything was going to be fine and that he was proud of her. She gave him a long look before speaking. I need to get going immediately, John. Would you mind if we remained in touch? I'm not sure why, but I feel secure around you, despite the fact that we had only just met. Something about you reminds me of my father, she added. John smiled. Sure, Jenny. Can I offer you my phone number? Please feel free to contact me whenever you need to. Sure, she replied, smiling. I hope you don't mind if I call at strange hours. He shakes his head. Not at all, Jenny. Call me whenever you want. They swapped numbers, and Jenny left. He proceeded for his SUV, unaware that Jenny had placed his discarded coffee cup in a plastic bag. He also didn't notice her writing down the number on his registration plate. John left the graveyard and walked to Griffith Park Observatory. It was time to put the plan into motion. Once there, he stared out over the city, where he had previously worked as a police officer. He took out two of the burner phones Ben had bought, disabled the first, changed the number to private, and connected the voice changer device Ben had given him. He chose the effect he desired and dialed a number. A woman answered the second ring. He knew Lydia's voice, Lydia Wilson. She spoke abruptly. Why? Why did you kill me? He asked before hanging up. He promptly turned off his phone and removed the battery. Lydia had just left a meeting with some of her husband's backers when the phone call came in. She heard the message and attempted to answer, but the call had already ended. She felt it sounded like her late husband, Avery, but she couldn't be certain. Surely Avery was not beckoning her from beyond the grave. She spoke to herself. She considered returning the call until she noticed the incoming number was set to private. She knew her current spouse had enemies and wondered whether the call was from one of them. John, meanwhile, had turned on the second phone. This time, he utilized it to send a text message to Robert's phone that included a picture. The caption read, Remember my promise? And the photo was recently shot of Robert outside his workplace with a crosshair over his groin. After confirming that the message had been sent, 
he turned the phone off and removed the battery. Both phones were later destroyed, and the parts were discarded in various garbage cans in the area. Robert, of course, noticed the photograph and read the caption. He knew it was about the commitment Avery had made to him on his wedding day so long ago, but it was impossible. He assumed Avery had been dead for ten years, and no one, not even Lydia, knew what his younger brother had told him. That night, things were strained in the Wilson family. Robert and Lydia discussed their encounter, but they dismissed it as the work of a political adversary and moved on. John followed the approach he and Ben had agreed upon, waiting three days before making his second set of calls. This time, he proceeded to adjacent Orange County before sending Lydia a snapshot of the video in which Robert shot him. The message captioning simply stated, Your sins will find you. The call to Robert's phone was also unique this time. He said, Remember, I can blow your balls off from 1,000 yards away before hanging up. He shattered both phones and disposed of the fragments in various garbage bins before returning home. Both Robert and Lydia were becoming increasingly apprehensive by now. No one but them and Avery knew what happened in that bedroom ten years ago, and Avery had died. How could this happen? They questioned each other, following the plan that John and Ben had sketched out. For several days, no calls or text messages were sent. John knew Ben was busy gathering information about Robert, so he used his free time catching up on the events of the previous ten years. Then he received a call and opened his smartphone. He discovered it was from Ginny John Smith. He answered, Hello, John. This is Jenny. Remember me? He smiled. He would never forget his tiny girl. Sure, he replied. What can I do for you? Can we meet tomorrow morning at my father's grave? Approximately 6 a.m., she asked. Of course I will be there. Is everything okay? I desperately need to talk to someone, she said. Okay, he informed her. See you there in the morning. Thank you, she added before hanging up. He wondered what she needed to talk to him about. The next day, he sat on a seat near the tomb, waiting for Ginny. She arrived just on time and sat next to him. Good morning, he said. She returned the welcome. He could see she was quite nervous about something. He thanked Penny for her views. She stared to the grave and then back at him. She opened her purse, took out an envelope, and gave it to him. What is this? he asked. You know, I remember the last time I saw my father alive, she added. Following the funeral, my mother married my Uncle Robert, who insisted I call him Dad. I refused, even though it made my mother angry. He kept saying he was my father, but I didn't believe him. I now have the truth. He's not my real father. She gazed at his face. Are you? John was shocked. How could she know, he wondered. She pointed at the envelope. I apologize for the intrusion, but after we met, I retrieved your coffee cup and cigarette butt from the trash. You know those things are going to kill you, she said. He laughed. Something about you made me think of that day ten years ago. You know, you can wear contacts to change the color of your eyes, get facial surgery, change the color of your hair, and even screw up your fingerprints. However, you cannot change your DNA. They were able to remove enough saliva. What? I discovered that they could identify you as my father with 99.9% .9 certainty. Wow, John stated. Ben was correct about you. You were resourceful. You'll make an excellent prosecutor someday. Jenny smiled. So who are you really? Who is buried in my father's grave if not you, she asked. The man you knew as Avery Wilson died 11 years ago, he said. My real name is John Smith. You can thank the feds for this. The official explanation is that Avery was murdered during a home invasion. But that's not true, is it? She asked. He shakes his head. No, he replied. Not even close. I knew it. I want the truth, father, she said. You owe me that. He enjoyed hearing her. Call him dad. And he knew she was correct. However, he was unsure whether she could bear the whole truth. Are you sure about that? He asked. It's more worse than you can imagine. He noticed tears in her eyes. Yes, I need to know, she replied. I accept that no matter how awful things are at the Wilson household, John replied. Jenny shakes her head. No, she replied. Mom and Robert have been on edge during the previous four days. According to what I've heard, they've been receiving weird phone calls and text messages, which has made them very upset. But isn't there more? John asked. She tried not to cry, but tears streamed down her cheeks. 
have they harmed you? She burst into tears, and John embraced her. It felt great to embrace his girl again, and he wanted to soothe her sorrow. She said, you'll probably hate me if I tell you this. John shakes his head. I would never hate you. You are my little princess and always will be. She enjoyed hearing him say that and tried to remain calm before proceeding. Robert has been molesting me, she explained quietly. John became enraged as she spoke. How long has this gone on? He asked. She stated that I was around 13 years old. John thought of the slime sucking. Have you dialed 911? He asked. She nodded. They sent someone out several times to inspect me, but mom claimed that was not true. Then they thrashed me and confined me in my room. They threatened to hurt me severely if I said anything to anyone else. What's on your schedule for today? John asked. Nothing, really. She said, school is out, but I can't stand being around the house any longer. These days, I'm just waiting to graduate so I can move out and attend college. You mentioned that you wanted to see proof. Would you like to come to my house so I can show you? He asked. Her eyes brightened. Really? She asked. Yes. That is something I would really want. John took out his phone and dialed Ben. Hello, John. What up? He asked. Ben, I need to see you at my apartment right now. John said that there had been a change in plans. Ben knew better than to pressure his friend. Okay, I'll come straight over. John concluded the phone call and accompanied Jenny to her car. Follow me, he told her. I'm in that SUV over there, he said, pointing to his automobile. He drove to his apartment, making sure Jenny followed him the entire time. He led Jenny to his flat and ushered her in. It's not as nice as yours, but it's home, he explained. It's perfect, Dad, Jenny said, looking around. It could benefit from a woman's touch, however. She accepted his offer of coffee, so he switched on his Keurig and let her select her preferred flavor. After having their coffee, they sat at his table. So where's the evidence, she asked. Are you sure you want to watch this, he asked. It's quite graphic. I told you I needed to see this, she explained. John unlocked his laptop and played the video of Dan, Robert, and Lydia plotting to kill him, followed by the actual shooting video. Her face grew white and tears ran down her cheeks. My God, she exclaimed as the video ended. I cannot believe they planned to assassinate you. By then, Ben had knocked on the door. John welcomed him in and introduced him to Jenny. So what's happening? Ben inquired after sitting down. Jenny knows who I am, John added, and she claims Robert has been assaulting her for years. I can't sit here and let that happen. Ben nodded his head. I understand, he replied. So do you believe it's time to step things up? I do, John stated. Ben considered for a moment before speaking. He stared at Jenny before speaking. Would you be willing to help us? He asked. Yes, she answered. Anything I can do to help. Ben looked at John. We could use a pair of eyes and ears in the Wilson household, he explained. Maybe she can set up some cameras and let us look around her house. I don't want her in danger, John remarked. No, she will not be. Are you willing to do it, Jenny? John asked. Jenny nodded her head. Absolutely, she said. I'm over 18 and want to help. There's nothing you can do to stop me, Dad, she added, focusing on the father. Furthermore, she explained, I've been taking self-defense training for several months. And I promised Robert that if he ever touched me again, I'd kick his balls up into his throat. He has not touched me since. John felt proud of his daughter's statements. She was certainly his gal. All right, Ben replied. I'll set you up with the equipment and demonstrate how to utilize it. He stared at John. Perhaps it's time to contact the media. I'll arrange an interview and get back to you. Is there anyone we can trust in the DA's office? John asked. Ben shakes his head. Things have altered dramatically in the past ten years, John, Ben said. I'd want to see all three of them hung. The truth is, they'll drag it out in court for years with no certainty that anything will be done. I apologize. That's exactly how things are now. Then it is up to us, John stated. Maybe we can enlist the help of some people in the East, Ben said. You know, they don't care much about publicity. John understood what that meant. He despised the concept, but recognized it could be their greatest hope. Okay. Arrange an interview. I will continue doing what I have been doing. Perhaps we can push their hand. He stared at Jenny. You set up those cameras like Ben instructed and don't take any chances. If you feel you are in any danger, please contact me or Ben immediately. You can stay here. Any questions? 
Ben and Jenny shake their heads. All right, let's go. They walked out with John, hugging his daughter. I'm very proud of you, Jenny, he whispered, tears threatening to fall down his cheeks. Jenny grinned and gave her father a kiss on the cheek. I love you, Dad, she said. I adore you too, princess, he answered. The next few days passed in a blur. John maintained his call and message campaign, pushing Lydia and Robert even farther to the brink. Jenny followed the instructions. Ben positioned cameras and microphones throughout the house. Even the household phones were wired. Robert and Lydia couldn't use the restroom without informing Ben and John. As a result, John, Ben, and Jenny gathered additional evidence against Robert and Lydia, including phone chats with the strange, shadowy persons who were supporting Robert's campaign. Ben gathered and examined every footage and phone calls, separating the daily fluff from the crucial stuff. Ben also spoke with a reporter he knew and trusted from the Los Angeles Times who contacted John. John Smith. He said when his phone rang, Hello, Mr. Smith. This is Elizabeth Johnson from the Times. I chatted with a buddy of yours who said, You have a story for me. Can we speak soon? Sure. If you're interested, I can show you some video as well. Yes, I am extremely intrigued, she replied. Can you stop by this afternoon? Yes, I can be there this afternoon. What time? John asked. They arranged to meet at 2 p.m. in a conference room at the newspaper's offices. That afternoon, before hanging up the phone, John looked at his watch. He had a little over an hour to get there, so he gathered his belongings and set out. He finally found a parking spot and proceeded to the conference room, where he met Elizabeth. She appeared to be around his age with short blonde hair. She looked great, even in her business attire. John naturally examined her fingers and found no wedding or engagement bands. He reached out to her. Miss Johnson, he asked. She smiled and accepted his hand. Please call me Liz, she said. Come in and have a seat. Can I get you anything? Coffee? Dear Latte. Coffee is always welcome, he remarked, smiling. Liz clicked the intercom button, ordering two cups of coffee to be delivered. Ben Jacobs tells me that you have a tale regarding Robert Wilson, and from what he tells me it sounds really interesting, she said. John nodded his head. Liz, how much do you know about the shooting death of his brother Avery? John asked. As I recall, the official report stated that he was slain during a home invasion. Are you saying that is not correct? Let me show you a few videos and let you decide. If you're still interested, let me tell you my story. And I must warn you, these films are extremely graphic, John stated. Is this okay? Sure. She stated that as John fired up his laptop, he navigated to the folder and showed her the video showing Robert, Dan, and Lydia plotting to assassinate him. Then they showed her the video of the actual shooting. Liz sat in her chair, shocked. So what do you think? John asked. Are you interested? Absolutely. I am curious, she said. How did you get the videos? I will explain. But first, I'd like to know how much of this is on record. John inquired if there was anything he preferred to keep private. Please tell me she said. John considered for a moment. Okay, Liz, John stated. Ben claims he trusts you. That's good enough for me. This is totally off the record. Officially, Avery Wilson died 11 years ago. John Smith might face a 10-year prison sentence as a result of the shooting. I was Avery Wilson. The feds arranged for Avery's new identity and would have placed him in protective custody for whatever reason, but their case went cold and nothing happened. However, Avery is still considered dead by the rest of the world. Are you following me thus far? Yes, Liz stated. You know, I'll have to vet this before anything is published. I'll definitely need to get these movies evaluated. I understand, John replied. If you look at your public records, you'll notice that Avery, which is me, filed for divorce in December 2008, and the papers were served on Christmas. The shooting occurred shortly after the beginning of the year. You should also locate an agreement suggested by Robert and his father, who are Lydia's attorneys. He continued to tell us this story, pausing only when he reached a point he intended to keep off the record. Let me show you one more thing, John added, pulling up the DNA test Jenny had performed on him. He presented it to Liz, who understood what the paper was saying. My God, she exclaimed, you truly are, or we are, Avery Wilson. Look, there's much more to this story. Would you be willing to discuss it over dinner? John asked. Liz smiled. Perhaps, she said. Let me think about it for a time before I call. Okay. Does it sound good, Liz? 
he said. I am looking forward to hearing from you. They said their goodbyes and John headed for home. The following day, Liz called him. Mr. Smith, I hope this is not too short notice, but I'd like to accept your dinner invitation. Sure, John stated. Where do you want to go? She mentioned that there will be a political meet and greet with several of the candidates, including Robert. I'll even get the chance to ask some questions. Are you still interested? That sounds interesting, John responded. Sure. Give me the information and I will pick you up. After Liz provided him with the necessary information, he called Ben to alert him. Are you nuts? Ben inquired. It will be all right, John stated. I'm dead, remember? Just be cautious and let Liz ask the questions. Have you got me? Ben inquired. Yeah, I got it, John stated. John called his daughter to let her know that he will be there with Liz. Thank you for informing me, she said. I'll be there, of course, so I will act as if we have never met. Thanks, John stated. Later, he dressed in his best suit and went to Liz's place. She looked stunning in her evening outfit. He replied, you look stunning, as she opened the door. She smiled. Thank you, sir, and you look quite dapper. They arrived at the event and joined the queue heading into the supper. Liz gave her invitation, which listed her plus one to the doorman, who welcomed them inside. Robert, Lydia, and Jenny were near the door, shaking hands with everyone who entered. John held his breath, hoping Lydia and Robert wouldn't recognize him. Robert reached out to Liz as she approached him. Good evening, Miss Johnson, he replied, taking her hand. It's very lovely to see you, and I see you've brought a friend, he continued, reaching out to John. John was about to lose his cool, but he took a deep breath and shook Robert's hand instead. So you are, he asked. Smith. John Smith, John informed him. He looked down and noticed Robert was wearing a Rolex watch. Lydia had given him a disastrous Christmas. Nice to meet you, Mr. Smith. This is my wife, Lydia, and my daughter, Ginny, he explained. John nodded at Lydia and Ginny. Ginny smiled sweetly, while Lydia glanced at him curiously. She didn't look particularly good, John thought. Wrinkles had formed around her eyes and mouth, and she appeared worn and emaciated. Too thin. He had a thought. John wondered if she recognized him, but dismissed the possibility. He said, Mrs. Wilson, Miss Wilson, and then moved on. John and Liz took their seats at the allocated table and introduced themselves to the other guests. He leaned into Liz. Lydia gave him the watch he's wearing ten years ago, he whispered. Really? she asked. Interesting. The supper went well, or as well as a rubber chicken. A political dinner can be held. John swallowed down his food and engaged in late-night discussion with others at the table. He glanced at Robert from time to time and noticed Jenny looking at him. He wasn't certain, but he believed he saw her give him a thumbs up. He smiled and returned to his food. Finally, the meal phase of the event concluded, and the MC introduced the candidates on the dais. Robert was the first candidate to address the audience after delivering his customary stump speech about restoring accountability in Sacramento. The floor was open for journalists to ask questions. Liz held her hand up and was chosen first. She stood and introduced herself. Elizabeth Johnson, Los Angeles Times. She stated, This is your first time on the political scene, and we don't know much about you, Mr. Wilson. Can you tell us how close you were to your brother, Officer Avery Wilson? Thank you for asking, Miss Johnson. He explained, My brother and I were very close. This had always been the case. His death struck us all very hard. Liz replied, I see. And you married your brother's widow soon after his funeral ten years ago, correct? That's correct, he said. So could you kindly explain why your brother named you and your father, as well as his divorce from his wife, which was filed more than a month before his shooting? Liz asked. Audible gasps echoed across the venue. That was ten years ago, Miss Johnson, Robert explained. My brother suffered from psychosis, possibly due to his military experience. I'm not sure why he would have done it. However, the divorce papers revealed a proposal made by both you and your father that would have robbed Officer Wilson of his rights as a husband, Liz said. Could you please explain this? Is it typical for two senior members of a law practice to handle a basic divorce like this? I do not recall such a proposition. Robert spoke hesitantly. We represented Lydia as a benefit for her years of dedicated service to us. 
He gazed around the room. Then he yelled out before Liz could ask another question. He addressed a man. Two tables away from Liz. Brad Williams, Orange County Register. He asked, could you please answer Miss Johnson's question? Did you have an affair with your brother's wife at the time of the shooting? More gasps were audible across the room. When John asked the question, Lydia looked down at her plate. That's an outrageous claim, Robert stated. I thought the world of my brother. I loved him. No one was sadder to learn of his death than I was at the moment of the shooting. Federal authorities were investigating your firm on allegations of involvement in organized crime. Could you please inform us what occurred with that investigation? Brad asked. We were cleared of all allegations and the case was closed, Robert stated. Then he pointed to another woman. A few tables away, Jane Holliday and Katie TV News. She stated, as I recall, the FBI never fully closed the case. They just stated that they couldn't discover any compelling proof to back up their allegations. Isn't that right? From our perspective, the outcome was the same. Robert stated that if the claims were true, my father would never be selected for his place on the court. John could see Robert was worried. The MC stood up and began the question and answer session before introducing the following contestant. I don't think he did himself a favor, John whispered to Liz. She gave a smile and nodded her head. I suppose you're correct, she said. You might want to look at the evening news when you get home tonight. A few hours later, the gathering came to a close and everyone up to go. Robert, Lydia, and Jenny dashed for the door, but were stopped by John and Liz. Mr. Wilson, John said, holding out his hand. Robert paused and shook his hand. I could not help but notice. Watch, that's a very great piece. May I have a look, please? Robert took it off and gave it to him. John inspected it and flipped it over to show Liz the inscription on the reverse, which was exactly what he had described to her the day before. He gave it back to Robert. I knew someone with a watch similar to that, John said. He stared at Lydia. To present something like that to your husband, you must really adore him. Lydia smiled. Yes, I do, mister, she started. Smith, John stated. Nice to meet you all. Please have a nice evening. He nodded at Ginny, who was smiling. Robert wrapped his arm around Lydia, and the three of them took off rapidly. John and Liz watched as they left. I believe you just received your tail, John, Liz said. John nodded as he turned to Liz. I believe so. He remarked this while taking up Liz's sweatshirt. Now that all is over, do you want to go somewhere nice? Maybe eat a proper dinner? She smiled. I'd love to, John, but I need to get home and file this story so it can appear in the morning paper, she explained. I understand. John? Liz turned to face John as he approached her apartment building. John, I wanted to let you know that I reviewed your previous police record. I wasn't trying to pry, but I needed to know what kind of man you are or were based on your record. She described you as a no-nonsense cop who never took guff from anyone. But what I observed tonight was different, she explained. I was amazed by the restraint you demonstrated. It couldn't have been easy to witness your wife and daughter with the man who shot them, John stated. I'm hoping to develop a relationship with my daughter, though. Liz nodded. I understand she's quite attractive and looks a lot like you. Listen, if you don't mind, I'd like to make things up to you. How do you like country and western music, she asked. I love it, John stated. Good. She smiled as she spoke. I know the exact location. If you're up for it, take me a week from this Friday. They provide chilled beer, the greatest burgers in town, and there is line dancing. You have a pair of jeans and cowboy boots, correct? I believe I can scare some people by then, he replied. If you don't mind teaching me how to line dance, I've been sleeping for the past ten years. Pick me up at, say, 630, she asked. John smiled. It is a date, he said. He got out of the automobile. I opened the door for Liz and accompanied her to her flat. She opened the door, then turned to give him a little kiss on the cheek. I'll see you a week from Friday, cowboy, she added before entering. Sleep tight as she shut the door. John felt like a schoolboy who had just had his first date. He virtually skipped and jumped as he returned to his car. He smiled. He drove home and promptly switched on the evening news. It took some time, but the local news networks broadcast extracts from the night's events. Tonight, several candidates for state government met with reporters to identify themselves. The news announcer stated that attorney Robert Wilson was questioned about his relationship with his brother, dead police officer Avery Wilson, 
and the officer's widow, who is now his wife. The footage showed a tense and irritated Robert evading questions that were fired at him. John smiled. Robert did not have a nice night. Wilson was confronted with allegations that he was having an affair with his brother's wife, who had been served with divorce papers less than a month prior to the terrible incident, the announcer added. Wilson disputed the charge, stating that he loved his brother. When the report was over, his phone rang. He picked it up. He realized the caller was Jenny. Hello, princess, he remarked as he answered the phone. Hello, dad, she said. Who was that hottie you were with tonight? Her name is Liz, a reporter. I assume you approve, John inquired. Absolutely, Jenny spoke. So I have a genuine date with her a week from this Friday, John stated. Good for you. By the way, Mom and Robert are going to erupt. They're furious about the questions he was asked. They've been on the phone with reporters since they arrived home. I'm not sure what you did, but you definitely got under his skin. John laughed. Yeah, he did not appear to be having a good time. John said, I'm simply grateful I was able to get so close to them without being identified. How are you holding up? I am doing okay. Jenny spoke. Look, I have to leave now. I have school tomorrow, but I will stay in touch. Love you. I love you too, princess, he urged caution. They stopped the call, but John's phone rang again. This time it was Ben. Hello, buddy, Ben said. I saw Robert on the evening news. He did not look well up there at all. Liz really put him on the defensive. Indeed she did, John stated. I think your concept of going to the media was good. Is there any news on your end? We have some interesting video from their house, as well as recordings of multiple reporter calls. Ben stated that your father had made another call and was dissatisfied with Robert's handling of the situation. I'm not surprised, John said. Jenny tells me they're quite upset. Well, I've had a few of things going on here, so I'll get to you later, Ben said. I believe his act simply captured the attention of his supporters, if you get what I mean. John understood exactly what Ben meant, and he knew it would not be good for Robert either. John continued to torment Robert and Lydia for the remainder of the week, sending tiny messages and phone calls in the hopes of driving them over the edge. He also spent time purchasing new jeans and cowboy boots for his date with Liz. Jenny had some time after school one day and joined him. I think someone's going to get lucky she informed her father as he modeled his new footwear for her. He laughed. Do you honestly think Liz would go for an old fella like me? He asked her. Please be old, Jenny spoke. You're in terrific shape and really attractive. She's insane if she doesn't fall for you. You're an excellent catch. I'm delighted you think so, Princess said. How are you holding up? I'm doing well, she remarked. Robert has left me alone since all of this began. He and Mom aren't doing too well. All they do is quarrel and bicker. I think it's time to step up our game a little, John added. I'll talk to Ben and Liz to see what they think. Jenny nodded her head. You may be correct, Dad, she said. They're very nervous about something. I'm thinking if it's time to address your concerns with Robert. Would you be comfortable with that? He asked. Jenny paused for a bit before responding. I'm never comfortable with it, but I know it has to be addressed at some time, she said. Would you be cool if I discussed it to Liz and had her discuss it with you? He asked. Yes, I suppose. She spoke uncomfortably. I trust you, Dad. Do what you believe is best. Okay, don't do something dumb. Okay, sweetheart. John stated his heart broke for her, and he wanted to pull out Robert's tool and feed it to the wolves for what he had done to his young girl. Liz called him after Jenny had left for her house. Hello, John, she replied as he responded. I just wanted to let you know that our technical team has reviewed the videos you provided and determined that they are both legitimate. I showed it to my editor who is interested in seeing what I can come up with. Do you have any other video or information you can share with me? Yes, I do, John stated. Would you like to meet for lunch or something? Another component of this I haven't spoken with you yet and it's really delicate. Yes, sure. Can we meet for around an hour? I will text you the address. That sounds good, John responded. I only need to hurry home and get my laptop. All right, Liz said. I will see you then. After receiving the address, John went home, grabbed his laptop, and proceeded to meet Liz. She chose a good cafe with outdoor seats, and John recognized her immediately. She smiled as he took the seat across from her. It's good to see you again, he remarked. You too, cowboy, she said. What do you have for me? The first issue concerns Jenny, my daughter. She knows who I am. 
and we've spent some time getting to know one other again. She is a truly outstanding young woman. It's great that you're getting to know her again, Liz said. What's up with her? She told me that Robert had been sexually harassing her since she was around 13, he said. Liz gazed at him, stunned. My God, has she phoned 911 or done anything? Yes, she claims to have phoned 911 twice, but her mother was able to get out of it by lying. He claimed that if Jenny called, they would threaten her. Call 911 again. We need to get her out of there, Liz said. John nodded his head. I know we do. However, she is already over the age of 18 and has nearly completed high school. She will be attending UCLA in the fall and intends to stay there. She is currently at home, biding her time. We have their entire house covered on audio and camera and we'll catch everything that happens. But I am torn. Part of me wants to get her out right now. But if I do that, I will end up putting her and myself in even more danger. These folks play for keeps and they wouldn't hesitate to kill both her and me. I have a second bedroom. Liz said she could remain with me if she wanted. Would you like me to speak to her? Do you mind? John inquired. I think she should chat to another woman. Someone who understands her point of view. Liz nodded. I'd love to talk with her. Could you please organize it? The sooner the better, Liz said. John nodded and took out his phone. How about now if I can arrange it? He asked. That would be fantastic, she remarked. John contacted his daughter and she answered after the second ring. Hello, Dad. Hello, Princess. Can you meet with me and Liz right now? He asked. Wow, she said. Where are you now? John handed her the address. Yeah, I'm not that far from there. I just finished my self-defense lesson and can be there in about 15 minutes. Okay, we will wait for you. After the call, John claimed we were sitting outside in the rear. He looked at Liz. She can get here in 15 minutes. Is this okay? He asked. Sure. Liz mentioned that it would be wonderful to have another lady in the place for a time. John inquired. Yeah. After my divorce, my daughter lived with me. My ex couldn't keep it in his pants, and I caught him once too often. He left and she remained. Then she was slain by a drunk driver. She was only 16 at the time. I am sorry to hear that, John remarked. I didn't know you had any children. Yes, I did. So I understand how you are feeling right now. You want to take Robert's tool off and force it down his throat, don't you? John nodded. He admitted, I've thought about it a few times. Don't do something dumb, she warned him. You have a daughter that needs her father, and I must admit that I like you too, she smiled. What, me? he asked. I am an old man. She shakes her head. Not really, she said. I bet you're no more than two or three years older than me. No way, I'm 47. You cannot be more than what? 35. She smiled. Thank you for the compliment. I am actually 44. But don't tell anybody. Okay. Your secret is safe with me, he assured her. Just remember, John Smith. You may be able to cut Robert's head off, and God knows you have every right to do so. But there's an old adage about not dealing with people who purchase ink in bulk, she said. Do what is necessary, but do not go too far. Thank you for the reminder, he replied. By the way, have you remembered to bring more video? She asked. Yes, I did. He is bringing up his laptop. This is all quite graphic, by the way. He transferred the files to a thumb drive and gave it to her. Use whatever you want. She snatched it from him. Thanks. She spoke just then. Jenny joined them at the table. John rose and offered her a seat. He introduced the two women. I saw you at dinner the other night. Jenny spoke. I adore how you nailed Robert. Thanks, Liz said. She looked at John. Do you want to go for a stroll, Dad? So Jenny and I can talk or we'll talk for a while. John raised his hands and stood. I'll let you two go at it, he said. He kissed Jenny's cheek and looked at Liz. Thank you, he replied. Give us about half an hour, okay? Liz asked. I get it. I'll be back in half an hour. After a half hour of window shopping, John returned to the bistro and rejoined the two girls. They laughed and joked like old friends. Liz smiled as she said, the avenging warrior returns. Okay, Dad, here is the deal. Jenny is coming to stay with me tonight until she starts at UCLA. She is welcome to stay for as long as she wants, but there is one condition. I will pay her way, John stated. I do not expect you to support her. That would not be correct. Liz shakes her head. Thanks. I appreciate it. But that is not what I intended. Beginning tomorrow, we both expect you to stop by and have dinner with us as often as possible. 
She suggested doing it every night if possible. Also, spend as much of your weekends with us as possible. Both women smiled at him. Okay, he said, this is actually two conditions, but I accept it as a deal. Jenny wrapped her arms around John and Liz smiled. Thank you, Daddy, she replied. I really love you. I adore you too, Princess, John said, tears threatening to fall down his cheeks as she sat back down. Liz held out her hand. Jenny, please let me look at your phone for a moment. I want to ensure that the tracking they have set up is disabled. Jenny handed Liz her phone, and John watched the older woman's fingers move across the screen. She quickly returned the phone to Jenny there. I disabled your GPS and removed the phone finder app. I did not see anything else. I've also included my phone number so you can call if necessary, she said. What are you planning to tell your mother? John asked. Nothing, really. Jenny only said that I would be staying with a friend for a while. I'm over 18, so she can't stop me. She looked at Liz and her father, wondering what life would be like with them together. Thank you both very much. Everywhere she looked. Liz, I will see you this evening, okay? Liz nodded her head. I will see you, she said. You have the key I gave you, correct. I got it right here, Jenny said before departing. After Jenny left, John said, I can't tell you how much this means to me, especially since we've just met. Liz took his hand. My gut instincts are usually correct, John, she explained. And right now my gut tells me to trust you. You've been badly hurt, and part of me wants to help you. Who knows what will happen? John nodded, indicating his understanding. But remember what I said earlier? Do whatever you have to do for Robert and Lydia, but do not cross the line. I understand, he replied. Liz grabbed his hand and gave him a stern look. Please promise me, she spoke. I will keep my commitment, John told her. She nodded. I'm going to hold you to it. I need to get going. I have to prepare for my new house guest, she explained. I will also look into those 911 calls. If Jenny calls, there will be a record. I'll tell you what I find. Okay, okay. Sounds good, Liz, John stated after Liz departed. John got a call from Ben. What is up? I've been answering the telephone. You got a few minutes? Benjamin inquired. John responded in the positive. I need you to come by and look into things. There was an extremely fascinating phone call. I'm going to be right there. John hung up. He exited the cafe after paying the bill and proceeded to Ben's office. When he arrived, he headed directly to Ben's office. He glanced up from his computer. John, please hear this. He turned around his laptop. John sat down and stared at the TV. Ben had both video and audio from the call and appeared to have synchronized the two. The video showed Robert answering the phone at his workplace. Wilson, he said. Bobby, exclaimed the man on the other end of the phone. Tony, Robert stated. A long time, no here. How are you doing, buddy? Bobby, Bobby, what? This garbage reading about your campaign, the man added with a peculiar New York accent. Tony, I'm not sure what you mean. Robert spoke. A Times reporter attacked me with some old news out of the blue. I thought we had resolved the issue with your brother a long time ago. Tony stated I did as well. Robert remarked, Look, Bobby, Mario isn't pleased right now. You know how he feels about loose ends, right? You must get this crap under control. Tony spoke. We're investing a lot of money in your campaign, and we can't afford for you to botch it up. Robert answered, I understand, Tony. Perhaps I should take care of that Times reporter. What are you going to do to this reporting lady for doing her job? Tony inquired. Are you crazy? You know, everyone with a blog is writing about it. What are you going to do? Whack every blogger on the earth. What are you, idiot? Look, Tony, tell Mario that I'll meet with that reporter and see if we can't calm things down a little bit. Okay, papers will write anything they wish. Do you know this? Robert spoke. I'll inform him. But you'd better get a grip on this stuff. Do you comprehend what I'm saying? Tony inquired. You are aware of Mario's strong belief in thoroughness. Do you get my point? Tony, I'll take care of it. No issue, Robert replied, evidently nervous. Bobby, Tony warned you that the next time there will be no phone call. Understand? You got it, Tony. I'll take care of things. Robert spoke. When the call ended, Robert's face turned white. As the video concluded, he sat back and grabbed a drink. Ben glanced at John. According to John, it appears that his fans in the East are dissatisfied with him right now. Robert appeared to be going to pass out. Ben said, it's worse than you know. 
I believe the man Tony alluded to as Mario is none other than Mario da Silva, one of, if not the most dreaded criminal leader in the country. I've heard that he's been attempting to recruit elected officials across the country to assist him with his different projects, which are only fronts for their criminal operations. Do you believe we should let them care for Robert and Sylvia? John inquired. I believe that if we provide the media just enough information to pique their interest in Robert's activities and background, they may simply take care of things for us, he continued. This De Silva figure is a high-level criminal, yet he's also regarded as a devoted family man. Isn't De Silva the one the feds were looking into? When I was shot, John remarked, why not turn this over to the feds? He certainly was. Personally, I'm not sure the feds can identify their own holes right now. I'm not confident after seeing how they botched this nine or ten years ago. It would not surprise me if De Silva had someone embedded in the FBI at the time. Why don't we go over all of our previous videos and check if there's anything on Mario or his cronies, John recommended. I think you might be on to something, Ben remarked. If they had any ties to De Silva, they would have talked about them. They openly discussed murdering you. Let us get started on it. Okay, that makes sense. John spoke. By the way, how's Liz doing? Benjamin inquired. Things are looking nice. We have a date coming up and Ginny is going to remain with her till she starts at Yale. Ben smiled broadly. Good. He spoke. Liz is a good woman and she will treat you well. Just don't mess it up with her. I'm curious, John explained. Why didn't you pursue Liz? I would. In California, however, incest is a felony. Ben said, My sister, the man she married was a cheater who couldn't keep his tool in his pants. She went through hell when her daughter was murdered. You take excellent care of her. Have you heard me? John gave a smile. Count on it, he said to his friend. John departed and went home, confident that things were finally improving for him. The next day, he had dinner at Liz's flat. I'm looking forward to the evening with the gals. Jenny answered the door, dressed in cutoffs and a t-shirt. Liz looked nice as well, and she wore denim cutoffs. He looked at her shapely legs and felt a familiar stirring in his groin. Liz responded, well, have a seat, as she served up a wonderful lasagna. The fragrance of the food in front of him made John's mouth wet. Liz insisted on saying grace before the dinner and requested John to lead them in Thanksgiving, which he did for the first time in a decade. He felt like he was at home. John ate two helpings of lasagna and seconds of Liz's green beans. The girls smiled to themselves as they watched him eat. This was his first prepared dinner in ten years, and he cherished each bite. Finally satisfied, he sat down and stared at Liz. He declared, that was the best lasagna I think I've ever had. Thank you, Liz. You are welcome, cowboy, she said. I'm delighted you enjoyed it. If you're interested, I believe we'll still have enough tomorrow. I most certainly am. He spoke. He turned to look at Jenny. Have you heard anything from your mom or Robert? He inquired. Yeah. She called earlier and inquired about where I would be staying. I merely told her that I'm staying with a friend. She wasn't happy, but I told her I was 18 and could stay wherever I wanted. I don't think she'll bother me anymore. John nodded. Good. Liz, any news from your end? He inquired. Yes. In reality, I performed some research and was able to obtain the 911 calls Jenny placed. I listened to them and checked the history of the house visits. Jenny was right. Lydia and Robert managed to persuade them that nothing happened. She looked at Jenny, who was uncomfortable with the topic. I believe Jenny and I should talk about it more later this evening. Are you cool with this? She inquired. Jenny? Yeah, I believe so. She spoke. Good. Liz spoke. So what about you? She inquired, her gaze directed at John. We did get some interesting audio of a call between Robert and a gangster's crony back east, we believe Mario da Silva is behind Robert's campaign, and he is dissatisfied with how things are going, John remarked. Isn't da Silva the one the FBI suspected your father was linked with? Liz inquired. I think so. Ben and I are going through every video. We need to look for any mentions of da Silva or anyone in his organization. I've spent most of the day doing that, but I still haven't found anything. You're aware that software exists to accomplish this, Liz inquired. John shook his head. No, I couldn't remember. I've been out of touch for a time. Do you have something like that in the paper? He inquired. Liz gave a laugh. She answered, I have something like that at home. I often use it to transcribe audio to text. It is not completely perfect, 
and I frequently have to go back through the output to correct problems, but it is much faster than typing while listening. How much are we discussing? There are likely hundreds of hours of video, I think John said. Bring it over and I'll get started on it. If that's okay, Jenny offered her assistance. John and Liz both agreed. Just as long as you complete your homework first, John remarked. Yes, Dad, you are smiling. Speaking of that, I have some studying to do, so if you don't mind, I'll get started. Okay, sweetheart, John responded. Jenny rose, kissed her father and Liz on the cheek, and went to her room. Liz waited for her to close the door before responding. Liz called your kid a great girl. Yes, I agree, she is. Liz said, I believe she will make a great attorney someday. I believe you're right. He up and helped Liz clear up the dinner table, washing the plates before placing them in the dishwasher. Liz appeared to be on the verge of tears. Are you all right? He asked as he took her in his arms. It's just been so long since I've had a man in the house, she explained. He hugged her as tears streamed down her cheeks. It's been a long time for me, too, he replied. Liz gave him a kiss on the lips before pouring them each a glass of wine. They sat on the couch and kept talking. So what comes next? She inquired. So your brother and I will keep digging to see what we can find. If my intuition is correct, De Silva will look after Robert for us, he continued. So you know, Ben is my brother, she inquired. Yes, he just told me, John replied. I realize I should have told you sooner, but I wanted to get to know you better first. Liz remarked, I owe your brother a debt of gratitude. I won't be able to pay. John spoke. He was the one who watched out for me when everything started ten years ago. I understand, Liz said. He has also been quite helpful to me. I could not have gotten through my divorce without his changing the subject. Do you believe De Silva might have murdered your brother? John answered, I don't know. I understand he is dreaded for a cause. At the very least, he has the ability to ruin Robert, and possibly even my father. I'll do what I can, she said. My editor has given me permission to go after Robert, but I must use caution. I do not want it to appear like a vendetta, and I don't want to publish anything that could lead to a lawsuit. Is it possible to use ten-year-old videos? John inquired. Maybe. We certainly cannot print the videos on paper, but we can use them on the website and print screenshots from them. I'd have to be very careful with how they're presented. Allow me. Please run that by my editor first. I'll do it tomorrow. However, I believe we should prepare for it using some of the other resources we already have. Good. If your editor agrees, I believe Robert's career will come to an end. He looked at his wristwatch. I believe I'll say goodnight to my kid and go home. Thank you for the wonderful supper, Liz. She wrapped her arms around John and passionately kissed him. He returned the kiss, felt his manhood begin to respond. She observed and grinned. Maybe we can stay and eat dessert someday she said. That is something I would want. He spoke. They released their embrace when Jenny entered the room. Okay, you two, Jenny stated. I swear I can't take you any place. John stood and kissed Liz goodnight before hugging his daughter. He bid goodnight to the princess. I'll see you tomorrow night, okay? Okay, Dad, she spoke. Sleep soundly. The next day, John maintained his campaign of texts and phone calls to Robert and Lydia, knowing that it was pushing them over the brink. He spent the most of his day copying all of his recordings into DVDs for Liz and Jenny. He had no idea how many incriminating films he had of them until he tried to put them all together chronologically. That night, at dinner, he handed Liz the CDs, who was taken aback by the magnitude of what he had given her. I spoke with my editor today, and he wants me to focus on the infidelity angle first, and then perhaps use it as a springboard into the other topics. Liz added. You've already provided me with plenty of evidence to back it up, and if Robert threatens Sue, we will bury him with everything we have. John mentioned sounds. When will this happen? Read tomorrow's paper. I have a feeling the shit will hit the fan, she remarked. John gave a smile. I can't wait, he stated. True enough. The news of Robert and Lydia's infidelity dominated the morning shows, with all of them discussing Liz's story. An article in the Los Angeles Times accuses state Senate candidate Robert Wilson of having an affair with the wife of his brother, deceased police officer Avery Wilson. According to the article, video obtained by the paper shows the officer's wife having sexual relations with both Robert and his father, Daniel Wilson, the current Superior Court judge. 
Obviously, we cannot post that video here, but screenshots published by the paper depict all three in a negative light. Eyewitness News and other agencies saw the footage, and we can confirm that the three are engaged in sexual behavior. According to the report, Officer Wilson's divorce papers mentioned both Robert and Daniel Wilson and alleged that his wife, Lydia, had an adulterous relationship with the two men. We contacted Judge Wilson but have not received a response as of this broadcast. Robert Wilson has previously denied any such relationship, and all attempts to contact Mr. or Mrs. Wilson have failed. According to the story, the tapes also made references to an East Coast crime gang. During these events, Wilson's firm was being investigated for ties to organized crime. Federal investigators have stated that they were unable to establish a conclusive link between the firm and the mob. The narrator stated that Officer Wilson was gunned down at his house just a few days after presenting his wife with divorce papers. We have also been warned that more details concerning the shooting may be released in the following days. Please stay tuned. John opened his paper, elated. He didn't normally read the newspaper, but he had to read the article. It was in black and white with blurred photos from the video. The piece was fairly lengthy, covering as much of the incident as possible. It also mentioned the mob links and hinted that the shooting might have been planned. When his phone rang, he jumped with joy. Smith, he replied, answering the phone. Did you read the entire article? Liz inquired. I've just finished it. That was fantastic, he remarked. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Right now I'm being swamped with calls. Everyone wants to speak about the article, so dinner may be late tonight. No problem, he said. I'll go visit Jenny and we'll cook you dinner tonight if that's acceptable. That is more than fine. She said something. Bye, we'll see you tonight. After he had hung up, his phone rang again. However, this came from a private phone. He accepted the call after wondering who it was from. Smith, he replied. Good morning, Mr. Smith, said the man with the thick New York accent. John recognized it as belonging to Tony, the man Robert had previously spoken to. Who's this? John inquired. What exactly do you want? Mr. Smith, please listen carefully, he said. There'll be a black sedan. In the following five minutes, pull into your apartment complex. Two men will come to your door. They've been told to accompany you to meet my boss. Do you have? There's nothing to worry about, as long as you follow their guidelines exactly. Am I being clear? You're clear. John stated that the call had terminated, and he called Ben to inform him of what had happened. I don't believe you are in any danger, Ben said but only in case. Turn on your phone finder app as I demonstrated and I will keep a watch on you. Call me as soon as possible. I believe the Silvas are preparing to cope with Wilson. Do as they say, and you should be all right. John followed Ben's advice, and as soon as he opened the app, he noticed a large black automobile drive into the apartment complex. A minute later, he received a tap on his door. He opened it and saw two men in suits and sunglasses. He also saw that their sidearms were in shoulder holsters beneath their jackets. Come with us, Mr. Smith. One of them spoke. John nodded and followed them inside the car. They placed a blindfold on him before assisting him into the back car and searching him for weapons. They found his cell phone and took it away. He heard the men get into the front seat as the door closed behind them. He determined to keep his calm and stay quiet while they traveled. He mentally timed the seconds and took note of the turns. I was hoping to get an indication of where he was headed. He felt the car come to a stop after about 45 minutes. The men came out of their car and opened his door. As they walked out from the automobile, one of the men held his upper arm. He heard a metallic door open and was directed inside. After the door was closed, the men removed his blindfold as his eyes acclimated to the gloomy room. He noticed a man of medium build approaching him. The man offered his hand and it was accepted. Mr. Smith, I'm delighted you could join us, the man added with a smile. My name is Mario da Silva. Perhaps you have heard of me. Please join me on this walk. John followed him as he entered another room. Robert, Lydia, and Dan were all chained to the wall. They sat on the hard concrete floor in their underwear, clearly terrified. Their feet were splayed out in front of them and tied to concrete staples, while their hands were chained above them. The man said, there are some people here who I thought you would like to see one last time. I'm sure you've met Mr. and Mrs. Robert Wilson, as well as Superior Court Judge Dan Wilson. John replied, yes, I know them. 
They all looked up at him, their eyes pleading for pity. Avery? Robert inquired weakly. Is that true? Do you understand? John spoke. Avery died. You murdered him ten years ago. Remember you and the three or four? He said, glancing at Lydia, who was crying. In reality, the three of you conspired to murder him. I imagine your chickens have finally come home to roost, right? John observed one of Mario's men carrying a taser. To function, it required electrodes to be put on the skin. He looked over to Mario. May I? He inquired, pointing at the taser. Mario gazed at him before focusing on the taser. He grinned and nodded for the man to give it over. John looked back at Robert as he held the taser. He noticed Robert's boxers were barely open enough to reveal his genitals. He crouched down and spoke into Robert's ear, loud enough for everyone to hear. This is for molesting Jenny, you worthless piece of trash, he said, putting the electrodes onto Robert's instrument and pushing the trigger. Robert shouted as the taser burned through him, causing him to shudder in pain. John got up and glanced down at Robert. And this is for your brother's wife, he explained, before kicking Robert in the groin as hard as he could, forcing him to scream once again. He bent down and spoke to Robert. He informed Robert, I just want to know one thing. Why? Robert paused for a moment before responding, because it was enjoyable. He spoke weakly. John stood and took a brief look at Robert. Then he kicked Robert in the groin multiple times. You know, you're correct, John admitted. This is enjoyable. He kicked Robert's groin one more time. Are you having a lot of fun? He shook his head as he glanced down at Lydia through a hole. I was always taught not to hit a woman, he claimed. Avery adored you with his whole heart. How did you reward him? By betraying his siblings and father? Then they plotted his death. And then you let this jerk to molest your 13-year-old daughter. Which kind of monster are you? You're not worth the effort. He continued on to Dan. You too. You swore to follow the law, but you don't know what the law is, do you? You screw your son's wife and then plan to murder him. You're a larger piece of garbage than Robert. You're aware of this. He stood back and kicked in the groin as well. Screw you. To heck with all of you. He rose up and thanked Mario's men as he returned the taser. Then he turned to Mario. Is anything else there? What is your name, Mr. De Silva? He inquired. Mario shook his head. No, he spoke. I just thought you'd like to say goodbye. John glanced at the three bound persons before him. Goodbye and farewell. He paused to gaze at Mario before proceeding. I considered killing them myself once, but I made a pledge not to cross that line. I keep my promises. Mario nodded before motioning John away. I know that about you, Officer Wilson, he added calmly. John stared at him, shocked. Yes, I recognize who you are. I also know your daughter is attending UCLA this autumn. According to John, she wants to be a prosecuting attorney. I'm confident she'll be an excellent one. Mario told John not to worry. I have no issue with honest prosecutors doing their job. My attorneys handle those matters for me. I do, however, have an issue with folks who double-cross me, as these three will quickly discover. Like you, I am a man of my word. I am also a dedicated family man. You have been given a gift. Most of us will never have a true second chance at life. So please take care of your daughter. Be a good man to Miss Johnson and enjoy a long, happy, and healthy life. He extended his hand to John, who accepted it using candy floss. My friend Mario said, Thank you. And John replied, Mr. De Silva, you do the same thing. Mario gave a smile. Please call me Mario, he requested. Every one of my buddies does. John gave a nod. Head, Bacon is the boss, Mario said. Mario smiled and nodded, motioned for the two men to transport John home. They blindfolded him again and led him to the car. A bit less than an hour passed. The blindfold was removed and John was given his phone. One of the men handed John a big bottle of brandy, an expression of Mr. De Silva's gratitude. One of the men asked, Please express my gratitude to Mr. De Silva, John said, and the men nodded as they left. John sat down at his table after checking to see that the car had left. He took out his phone and realized that his hand was shaking. He took a cup of coffee and strolled onto the balcony to light a cigarette, hoping to soothe his anxiety. He called Bien once he'd calmed down. Are you okay, John? Benjamin inquired. I have lost all signals from your phone. Yeah, I am okay. John spoke. He recalled his experience with Mario and the three cheaters who had ruined his life. This explains a lot. Ben said, 
I lost signal from their residence. It's almost as if they jammed all electrical signals before capturing Robert and Lydia. It's probably a good thing you got Jimmy out of there while you could. I agree. They concluded the conversation, and John finished his cigarette while staring out the balcony around 5 p.m. He visited Liz's flat and knocked on the door. Jenny responded and allowed him in. He hugged his daughter tightly. Dad, are you okay? She asked. Yeah, I'm just happy to see you, he said. Jenny said, I'm glad to see you too. Liz called and said she'd probably be fairly late. What do you think about merely calling for pizza? Pizza sounded wonderful to me. I brought a deck of cards. Want to see if you can beat the old man at spades? Jenny smiled as she remembered playing card games with her father when she was younger. I've had enough of practice since the last time we played, she explained. He took out the cards. So let's see what you have, he said. They took a notepad and a pencil, sat down at the table, and played spades until John called. He answered the phone, noting that it was now nine o'clock and they had been playing for more than three hours. Hello, John, Liz said when he responded. Have you watched the news? No, Jenny has been tearing my pants off in spades, John stated. What's happening? You should switch on the news, she said. It appears that De Silva has taken care of Robert and Lydia. I'm sorry, but I've been doing interviews all night and will be trapped here for at least a few more hours covering this story. Can you all handle dinner on your own? Not an issue, John stated. We were thinking about phoning for pizza. Pizza is great. I apologize, John. I'll get home as soon as I can, she added. I understand. We will be here, John stated. Thank you for telling us. He ended the call and switched on the television to hunt for local news which he found on a channel that was covering the issue. Eyewitness News has just received this information. An announcer stated that state Senate candidate Robert Wilson's home burned down today. Firefighters discovered the bodies of three people, one woman and two males. It is unclear what caused the fire, but investigators say they are investigating and have not ruled out foul activity. Mr. Wilson and his wife Lydia are thought to have been among those killed. Stay tuned to Eyewitness News for updates as they become available. Jenny gasped and burst into tears when the news came in. John got injured as well, but above everything he cares for his daughter. He hugged her while she sobbed. Soaking his shirt in her tears, his phone rang, and he placed Jenny down before answering it, saying it was from Ben. Have you seen the news? Ben inquired. Yes, I did, John said. Did you have any idea what was about to happen? He asked. No, I didn't, John replied. Was they still alive when you last saw them? Ben inquired. Yes, they were, John replied. I made Liz a promise, which I kept. Okay. I believe you, Ben said. I'll let you know if I hear anything. Take care of Liz and Jenny. I will. John said this before hanging up the phone. Jenny gazed at him after he put his phone down. Have you have anything to do with this? Jenny asked through tears. No, I didn't, John replied. Made a vow to Liz. I admit that I wanted them to suffer some pain, and I used to want to kill them because of what they did to you and me, but I had nothing to do with it. You swear to me on a stack of Bibles? She inquired. If that's all it takes, he said. Have I ever lied to you? No, you have not. She claimed he hugged her while she cried over her mother. John's phone rang again, and he noticed the call was from Liz. Hello, Liz. What is up, John? Please tell me you had no knowledge of this, she said. No, I was unaware of this, he answered. Good. I had to inform the police of Jenny's whereabouts and they will arrive shortly. No doubt they'll have some inquiries. I will be leaving soon and we can discuss when I get home. Okay? Okay, John stated. Jenny? Liz asked. She's understandably unhappy, but she'll be okay, I believe he said. Okay, she said. Look after her and I'll see you in a bit. That sounds wonderful. I will go ahead and order the pizza, John stated. They said their goodbyes and the call terminated. John contacted a local Domino's Pizza and ordered two huge pizzas for them. He sat with Jenny until he heard a knock on the door. When he answered the door, he noticed two huge Los Angeles Police Department policemen. One of them was Sergeant Taggart, with whom he had previously worked ten years earlier. Is Miss Jennifer Wilson here? The sergeant asked. Yes, John answered. Please come inside. The cops entered with Taggart and examined him attentively. Who are you, by the way? Taggart questioned Smith. John Smith? He said, I am Miss Johnson's friend, and I am here to look after Jenny. Do you have any identification? Taggart asked. John nodded and took out his driver's license. 
Taggart eyed it well and gave it back. Where were you since five o'clock today? He asked. John said, I left home at five o'clock and came right here. I've been with Miss Wilson all this time. He looked at the cards on the table. She beat me bad in spades tonight. Taggart looked at the table, then at John. You remind me of someone I knew a long time ago, he said. Do you know the Wilsons? No, I don't, John replied. Taggart turned to Jenny. Miss Wilson, he asked. Jenny's eyes were wet with tears. I'm sorry to say this, but your mom, dad, and granddad died in a fire at their house tonight, he told her. Robert wasn't my dad, she said. He was my uncle when my mom married him. I see, said Taggart. Can you tell us why you are here? She looked at John, then spoke. My uncle hurt me since I was 13. Miss Johnson found out and let me stay with her till I go to college in the fall, Jenny shared. Taggart felt sorry for her. Did you tell anyone, he asked. Yes, two times, she said, but no one helped, and my mom scared me not to tell again. Taggart was surprised. He knew Lydia when she was with her first husband and couldn't believe she'd let her daughter suffer like that. I'm sorry for your loss and for what you went through, he said. Jenny looked at him, her eyes suddenly sharp. Taggart knew that look. He had seen it in her dad a few times before he was killed. I'm not sad they're gone, Jenny said with heat. I'm happy they planned to kill my dad, then that bad man hurt me again and again. Taggart listened as she let it all out. I get it, Miss Wilson. I knew your dad, he was a great cop, he said, then gave her his card. If you need anything, call me. And here's a number for someone to talk to about your sadness. I think you should call them. He stood and turned to John. Mr. Smith, if you care about this girl, you should get her help fast, he said before leaving. The pizza arrived soon after the cops left, and Liz came in a bit later. Jenny was still on the couch, drying her eyes. Liz hugged her, then went to the kitchen where John was slicing the pizza. She could tell John had something on his mind after he served the pizza. He turned to Liz and Jenny. We need to talk, he said. He put their pizza on the table and asked them to sit. What's happening, John? Liz asked. First, I swear I had nothing to do with tonight. I promised you, Liz, and I keep my word. De Silva's guys called me this morning. They took me somewhere, I don't know where. They made me wear a blindfold and drove around. And I saw them, Lydia, Robert, and Dan. We had a fight. I hit Robert, but I swear they were alive when I left. I didn't think this would happen. The girls looked at John. I trust you, John, Liz said. Thanks for being open tonight. Jenny hugged her dad. I trust you too, dad, she said. John's eyes filled with tears. Liz saw it and gave him a look. There was a time I wanted them dead for what they did to me and to you, Jenny, he said, crying. Then I met you both again. Meeting you, Jenny, and you, Liz, made me see I'm not who I was ten years ago. That man could have easily ended them. But I'm not that man anymore. Something De Silva said clicked. You talked to De Silva himself? Liz asked. John nodded. Yes, he said I was given a new shot, a new life. A life with you, Liz, and with you, Jenny. I'm not the man I was ten years ago. Liz, I am sorry. Liz hugged him as he wept. No, you're not the man you were. You don't need to say sorry. You're a better man now than you were ten years back. After they hugged and shed tears for a bit, Liz looked at John. You know, it's been a long day and it's late. How about you stay here with us tonight, she asked. Yeah, I can sleep on the sofa, he said. Liz and Jenny shook their heads. No way. If it's okay with your daughter, I want you to stay with me. Jenny smiled. Are you sure? John asked. Yes, my love. There's enough space in my bed, she said. But keep in mind, I'm a one-man woman, and I expect you to be a one-woman man. John smiled. It's a deal, he said, kissing her. He looked at Jenny. Are you okay with this? Yes, Dad, she said. I'm more than okay with this. They hugged a bit more ate up their pizzas and went to bed after a night of gentle love. John woke up with Liz's bare body around his. This feels right, he thought with a smile. Six months later, John and Liz got married. Ben was John's best man and Jenny was Liz's maid of honor. Life was looking bright. The checks showed that Robert, Lydia, and Dan all died from breathing in smoke. Fire folks found that a wire problem in the old home started the fire, which spread fast through the wooden home helped by lots of papers and old legal books Robert and Lydia had kept over the years. 
Jenny went to UCLA and split her time between the college and her dad's condo. Though John didn't need to work, he joined Ben to work as a private eye. But there was one thing left for him to sort. One day, Jenny called to tell him that his mother, Barbara, was in the hospital with a bad kind of cancer, mixed with times of forgetting things, the doctors said. The old woman wasn't going to live much longer. John took Jenny and Liz to see her one last time. As he walked into the hospital room, he saw his mother's state. She slowly opened her eyes and saw John. Tears fell down her cheek. Avery? She asked weak. Is that really you? He sat by her. She looked closely at his face. My God. Avery, I'm so sorry for all. Can you ever forgive me? He took her weak body in his arms and hugged her. My name is now John Smith, he whispered. But yes, it's really me. And yes, I forgive you, he said, tears running down his face. She cried as he held her. They held each other for a few minutes before she began to get tired, laid her down and smiled at her. Thank you, John. I can die in peace now. Worn out. She slept. They left the room as she slept. She died a few weeks later, but had managed to change her will by then. John split her big wealth in two for him and Jenny. He took care of her last send-off, laying her next to her man. Looking at the four graves of his old family, John saw De Silva was right. He did get a rare chance, and he planned to use his new start well. Dear folks, let us know what you think below, and don't skip to hit like, share, and follow Queen Cheating Tales.